Start out tonight, take your, take your Bible, turn to Numbers 21. I have it up there on the screen. I have it for a reason. Anytime I come across something that proves the Bible right, I like to, you know, it's kind of my job to let everybody know about it. Hey, I found something in the Bible that's right. I'm going to tell everybody. Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's good when the Bible can be proved right, but I don't need it. I walk by faith, not by sight. And uh, so I just, my first assumption is the Bible's right. And I've had, I've had my faith challenged. I've had it challenged intellectually. I've had it challenged emotionally. And uh, in both cases, God, I found God to be true in everything that he said and everything that he promised. He's a true God. Amen. Numbers 21, uh, very quickly, and then we'll get uh, back into uh, our study of the Gospel of John. Let me put my bookmark there so I can get to it easily. I think we were in John uh, 18, maybe, something like that. So, or 19, I'll know here in a minute. But in, in Numbers chapter uh, 21... We have a story that if you don't believe the Bible or if you don't believe in uh, the, the phrase supernatural means it's higher than nature. It's higher than natural. It doesn't naturally occur on this earth. Okay, that's what it means. The phrase paranormal uh, means something besides or beyond normal. We could use that phrase to describe a lot of the people in this church. Para, so we'll have the paranormal Olympics. <laughs> yeah. We'll try that and see how it works. Uh, but anyway, those are two phrases that basically describe a lot of what you see in the Bible. Uh, the Bible is a book of historic events with true historic events happening, and it's amazing that you'll have a you'll have a, a, a sort of a revival of intellectualism, and all the intellectuals will will say that they have proof that the Bible can't be right, that uh, the archaeology proves it to be wrong, that there was no reference to uh, the Israelites ever being in Egypt and being in bondage, and they said that for years, and then oops, somebody found evidence that the Egyptians kept Israeli or Jewish slaves. And there was a guy named Moses, okay? Wow, where did that come from? And so uh, scholars hate stuff like that to come along. Uh, but then uh, not only of a, of a historic, intellectual, reasonable, uh, reliable account of history, you also have a glimpse. God is giving us a glimpse into the spiritual realm. We're, we're looking at things that we don't ordinarily see here on this earth. We don't see them every day. You don't see spirits when you wake up first thing in the morning every day, okay? You may feel them some days, but you don't see them. Uh, and, some, and if we were to, if I believe if God were to open our eyes in one day's time and let us see the spiritual, the, I mean, I mean spirits battling over us, uh, I think I think we would just like fall in reverence to God in his word and say God. I really need you. Whoa, that's messed up and uh, So anyway um, a, uh, a video came across my feed today uh, And I kind of look for Paranormal or supernatural things that people are catching on video and I have a I sort of have a theory that that uh, I think works when you could ask the question, how is it that uh, ghosts, spirits, geists, um, haunts, haints, boogers, I'm using American vernacular here, um, how is it that those all of a sudden now are showing up uh, in pictures or in video? How is that? Well, I think that our, that I know for a fact God designed the human eyes 
and it has, uh, it has its restrictions. There are things that animals can see that we can't see. We know that to be a fact. But there is also things that animals cannot see that we see every day. And my dad, it took him some time to convince me that deers can't see orange. Because I thought, that's the stupidest thing ever. I'm, I'm 11 years old. I know better than that. Yeah. Dad said, put on this orange cap and that orange vest. Dad, they'll see me. They can't see orange. I don't believe that. Sure enough, they can't. Because that deer, the first deer I shot, he said, you know, I never saw you. But I'm on a, man, I'm wound up today. Wait till PMO tomorrow, okay? But anyway, um, I think, do what? Here's the bottle. Um, I think technology... We, well, I know for a fact that um, the chips that they make to capture light in most commercial cameras, and I'm talking about cameras in your phone, cameras in your tablet, uh, the digital cameras uh, that we have now, and I mean, we have access to uh, tools that most people just didn't have 40 years ago. It's, it's that it's come on that quick and of course n by instinct now people automatically grab their phone when something happens we've just been guided in that direction uh, I've got a traffic cam uh, not a traffic cam but a, a dash cam on my car because I just figured somebody is gonna hit me and then try to lie about it and I'm gonna go well let's see you in court because I got the proof uh, but anyway, I think those, those chips are designed differently than the human eye is. And they're able to pick up things that people just don't see. Because you see a lot of photographs of people that are like in a group photo and they got their arms around each other. And all of a sudden, when you look at the picture, there's some little ghostly kid's face, you know, sticking out between two people there. And, and everybody's going, who is that? Nobody knows who it is. And that is occurring a lot. Now you can say, well, that's all, that people do that computer generated, and computer animated stuff. I, I do know that some people do do that, but it's not as easy as, as you would think it is. It requires a lot of work and a lot of talent to generate a, a face of some kind from scratch and put it in a photograph or a digital photo and not be found out because it's real easy to find out whether or not that image has been manipulated or not. So I said all that to say this, a um, couple few years ago, uh, a man by the name of Dr. Stephen Greer released a, another documentary that he had made about the UFO issue. Stephen Greer is somebody I'll refer to as a religious UFO Ologist. His whole outlook of spirituality, of uh, the spirit world, of religion, his whole outlook has been shaped now for the past, I'm going to say 50 years or better, uh, by seducing spirits with doctrines of devils. He, is, he has been in contact with familiar spirits since he was in college, but he was told that they were beings from another star and uh, that they lived on such and such a planet and that's what he believes. But they're still, they are your run of the mill, off the shelf devils is what they are. They're just masquerading, they're playing this part. And uh, so he learned how in college to get in contact when he wanted to with the UFO. And he got pretty good at it. So what he did was he started teaching people how to do it. And there's, I mean, he's made several videos where he'll have people on a beach or out in the desert or in a wilderness area. It's always away from people. And he'll have them out there and they'll all be meditating and they'll be doing uh, yoga, trances, yoga, mantras, yoga. This is called a mudra. The different, the way they do their fingers. There's a, there's a meaning behind every hand gesture that you do in yoga. So they're out there sitting there all wadded up and they're chanting all these mantras and they're, they're emptying their mind. Basically, they are opening themselves up to spiritual contact. And lo and behold, 
all of a sudden, out on the ocean, there'll be, it'll, you know, be dark, and out over the ocean, there'll be a, uh, an amber orb out there, obviously clearly up in the sky, but glowing on the sea, and then another one pops up, and then another one pops up. They usually don't come any closer than that. They make their appearance. Everybody goes, ooh, ah, some people start cursing, and then they leave. And these people now are hooked on that. They're going to follow these beings. And they're going to try to always get in contact with them. And so um, look at Numbers 21. Because you're going to get uh, a spiritual story. And what I mean by that is a story about spirits. And it says here um, that in verse 4... They journeyed from Mount Hor, by the way, of the Red Sea, to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. I've been there. I've been much discouraged because of the way. I've been there. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Now they lied through their teeth. They had bread. They had water. They just didn't want it from God. They didn't want God's bread. They didn't want God's water for some reason. And so the verse 6 is what I have up on the screen. The Lord sent what kind of serpents? Fiery serpents. I've read commentaries. Commentaries will say uh, that means that when the serpents bit them, uh, it burned like fire. No, that's not what it says. Fiery serpents. What the Bible's telling you is they're not made of carbon based molecules. They're not made of flesh and blood. They are made of spirit fire. That is their substance. The, the book of Psalms says his, that God made his, his angels, his spirits, a flaming fire. That is their substance, is what they're made of. So they sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died and if you don't believe that these were spirits then go look at the antidote the antidote is not a physical antidote the antidote to the poison is spiritual they must have faith in what God said God said if you put a, a brazen serpent brass equals fire on a pole and the people if they were to look upon it then they would live now, all that does is require a simple glance at this cross with a serpent on it. That's all it takes. And Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So we know it's a, it's a, it has a relation and a connection to the gospel of Jesus Christ. As those people, by faith, looked upon that brazen pole with the serpent on it, so anyone who believes in Jesus Christ shall have eternal life. We'll live and not die. Okay? So that's what happened. Now, uh, Isaiah 14 mentions, and there's another verse as well, but I didn't put it in here for time's sake. Isaiah 14, 29. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root, we know who the serpent is. Out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. Now let me ex very quickly explain what that is. It was a feathered serpent. It was a feathered serpent. The, the word Quetzalcoatl. That was the god that Hernando Cortez, when he went to Mexico, um, he goes and he finds out their religion, that they have a god that they worship called Quetzalcoatl. And that this god, let's get, check this out. This god, Quetzalcoatl, died on a cross for his people. So it was easy for the Catholic priest to go in and say, okay, you got the thing right, you got the names all wrong. It's not Quetzalcoatl, it's Jesus. The word Quetzalcoatl means feathered serpent what it means and it, a cockatrice is a feathered serpent so and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent in other words has it doesn't move on the ground it flies through the air okay it, it is a prince 
of the power of the air. It has power over air. Now, uh, so Stephen Greer takes people out and he shows them how to get in contact with what he calls aliens or these, these extraterrestrial beings or whatever he refers to them. During one of these meetings that they had, uh, a photographer took a, a photograph at what turns out to be the right time and nobody saw it, but when they looked at the photo, they could clearly see this glowing serpent-like thing flying through the air and it went directly to a, a person sitting in the chair here and the serpent's head touched this man or woman on the forehead and it gave them what is referred to as a kundalini experience. And it's basically, it's the same as being slain in the spirit in these charismatic churches. It's the same thing. It's called a shakti pot. And a guru will slap you on the head or hit you on the head, touch you on the head. And you will be, you will have your third eye illuminated instantly because he did that. Uh, so they... Um, they showed this in his uh, most recent um, documentary, and I took a, I just took the, the video image of it, screen captured it, and you can clearly see this has got like a spine in it, a glowing spine, clearly a serpent-like thing. Now check this one out. This is the guy sitting there. Look at what's on his head. That's a serpent. That's a fiery flying serpent. There's a photograph of it right there. This Bible's right. This Bible's right. It's almost like God made sure that this story gets put in the Bible because he knows 4,000 years later, we're going to start seeing these things. So there was this couple. Some of you have already seen that, but you haven't seen one. There was this couple that uh, went out for a ride. I guess maybe they had a new car or something like that. Nobody goes out for just a Sunday drive under Biden's gas prices. Amen. And um, so they're out for a drive and all of a sudden they get a notification on their phone that one of their in-house security cameras detected motion. So naturally they're like, we're gone and there's nobody home. So what's in our house? So they pull out their phones and it's a, it captured a video of this flying through their house very rapidly. Boom. And, and maybe tomorrow I'll show the video on Pastor Mike online. But it's very quick. And it clearly, I mean, it, that you're dealing with a fiery flying. It's, it's almost identical to this right here. Okay? You're dealing with the same thing. Now. Since we're talking about the cross, let's go back to um, jo uh, John 19. John 19. And remember, uh, the things that Jesus did on the cross, they were foreshadowed. And so this story out of Numbers 21 was a direct, it, it was pointing Everybody who will believe it, it points them right to the cross. And it's part of um, what Isaiah said in Isaiah 28, that in order to understand the Bible, if you want to know doctrine, you want to understand the Bible, then it's going to be here a little, and it's going to be there a little. So you read uh, Numbers 21, and you say, wow, that's a weird story. That's, I don't understand that. Why is that in the Bible? And then you read John chapter 3, and you get to verse... Uh, 15 for as Moses lifted up the serpent and you're going away, but I just read that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness Even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life and so That is God putting those two things together for you. You already read the Old Testament version of it. Now. You're seeing it fulfilled. I also believe that there is a last days fulfillment of even that I think the, the purpose and the power of the cross has still yet to be fully seen in this world, 
Can you say amen to that? I mean, just think about it for a while, okay? God's not done. He's not left this earth by itself, I guarantee you. So now, uh, we were here uh, the last day. We, we didn't have church last Wednesday, right? It was, that was Thanksgiving. So it's been a couple weeks. But anyway, in John chapter 19, verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And we did cover that, and there was a set a vessel of full of vinegar. We talked about that, how uh, vinegar represents bitterness, death is bitter, and so on. And they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. We saw that uh, given to us. Uh, where was that? In the book of James. Therefore, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished. It's the only two places in the whole Bible you'll see that phrase uh, mentioned in the scriptures. And it, it's almost like, well, I know it. I mean, I know for a fact that God wanted those words put in, in Greek there and then translated into English into the very words that Jesus said at, at the end of his suffering on the cross. It is finished. Boom. He, Gave up the ghost. Sin, when in his finish, bringeth forth death. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And people have a problem with that. Oh, it's, it's not a ghost. Was Casper the ghost? And we've let Holly Weird dictate to us the, the definitions of these words. A ghost is actually, that, that word derives from places that our English language d came from. Part of our English language came from French. It was Norman language from the Normandy of France. And uh, we speak, we have German mixed in there because France and Germany share a border. And people that spoke French years ago, hundreds of years ago, they may have also spoke German at the same time. And some of the words get mixed together and so on. And so we received those words seven, eight, nine hundred years ago, and um, where was I going with that? Okay, the word ghost is like both a French and a German derivation. The German word is geist. Okay, you may have heard of the phrase zeitgeist. Okay, it means like the, the spirit of the day or the spirit of the times. And uh, so it's, it's not a big deal. The word ghost simply means your spirit. And he gave up the spirit. Now, he doesn't have life in his body anymore. He is, he is clinically, legally dead. So verse 31, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was in high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Alicia, if, if you can hang around a little bit, we're going to, would you like to be anointed? Okay. All right, we're going we're gonna to do that tonight. Um, she's had, uh, what, three or four episodes from Sunday till now. And they, they are thinking that it might be related to something they, uh, what was the word again? Something with migraines. Complex. Complex. Maybe that's why I couldn't remember the word too hard for me yeah uh, complex migraines and uh, so it's 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 hard to take it's hard for us to watch her go through this it's hard harder for her to go through it so we're gonna pray and anoint her tonight but anyway he gave up the ghost and the Jews because of the law knew that they had to get him down off that cross uh, before uh, the dark because it was against the law. It didn't matter how rotten and evil the man was. Uh, the Jewish law said you cannot leave someone hanging from a tree past, past the evening. You can't do it. Take him down, bury him properly, all right, that he might be taken away. So turn to Joshua 10. Oh, when I read this story, and saw this for what it was. I want to tell you something. I don't remember where I was when it occurred to me what I was looking at. 
I may have been with Lisa somewhere, and I would, I would have went, <gasps> and that always scared her. Because I would be thinking, you just, and God was leading my mind with connections in the Bible. And I, there's several times where I would just be sitting there, and she's like, what are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm just thinking some things from the Bible. And I would go, <gasps> and she would like, what? And I would say, oh, it's beautiful. So, sorry I scared you so much, dear. Uh, but anyway, this is one of those places I would have done that. This is, uh, Joshua 10 is the chapter where Joshua asked God for permission to stop the sun and the moon. Because Joshua's winning the battle. But he sees that it's getting dark. And he's like, uh-uh, I'm not having it. I am not going to go to bed tonight with the enemy still out there that need killed. They need to be killed. I'm the killing guy, and I'm going to kill them. And so he asked God to give him time to kill them, and God uh, tells him, yeah, go ahead. And so Joshua is the one who said, son, uh, stand still, moon, stand out still, and so on. And so it did that. The whole length of a day. And Joshua is just killing away, man. He's killing away. They find the five kings of these armies that they're battling against. The five kings got together and they said, we got to hide somewhere. They went and found a cave to hide in. Now, there's a reason why it was five. Not four, not seven, not ten. It was five. Five represents death. Read Genesis 5 and you'll see it. It's there over and over and over again. Everybody's mentioned five times. Fifth time they're mentioned, they die. The law of Moses. Moses wrote five books. We call it, the Bible calls it the law of sin and death. Okay, the letter kills. The law kills. The spirit gives life. And so these five kings represent death. And so these kings go hide in a cave. And when Joshua's men find out that they're in there, they said, Captain Joshua, yes, yes, what did you need, soldier? Sir, we found the five kings. Uh, they're in that cave over there beyond that next hill over there. What do you want us to do? Tell you what, I'm in a killing mood right now, but I ain't got time to deal with that. Why don't you throw some stones up and lock them up in there, and we'll deal with them shortly. I'm still, I am still got to say, I can see Joshua talking like this and slinging a sword like this and just killing people. Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah, yes. Put them in that cave over there and lock them up over there. Yeah, I'll get to it in a minute. You get back. So anyway. Um, when it comes time now, verse 22. 22 is the number for Revelation. And what did Joshua say? Open the mouth of the cave. Okay? You know, who the, you know that the mouth of the cave is related to the strange woman in the book of Proverbs? Because her mouth is a deep pit. And it's a, it's a big, big death pit is what it is. Her mouth is. She opens her mouth and she swallows up people. And I just think it's cool that God made that strange woman to, and we're talking about Babylon here, is basically the, the pit to hell. Okay, anybody that has any dealings with her, you're going to hell. You're going to hell because you've chosen her over God. But anyway, so verse 22, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so, brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth. Did you know that there's somebody right now who by his rights, of, of uh, inheritance and his herald, heraldry rights. I'm not saying that word right. He is a uh, European so-called king, but he, his official title is king of Jerusalem. He's named himself that or, or his ancestors who filled his position before him were referred to as the true and rightful king of Jerusalem, which we know is a, a, a lie. Jesus is the king of Jerusalem. Amen? 
So here, you know, we got it. We've got a, it's almost like a secret society of the elite. Who believes that one? Yeah. And uh, their, their exalted leader is referred to as the king of Jerusalem. Well, king, you're fixing to get it. So the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel. And this, watch this now. He didn't just say, captains, come here. He said, all the men. I want all the men to come here. God is including us, guys. Okay? He's including us in his victory. Tell God thank you sometime. Amen? I and mean, he could have left you out of it, but we get to get in there and fight with him. And we're guaranteed to win. So he says unto the, all the men of Israel, and he said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near. What does that indicate? You have five toes on this one, five toes on that one, ten total. You put the feet on there, you, are, you have dominion over them. Those kings do not have dominion over these Israelites any longer. There will come a time because of the cross. In fact, is now. Death no longer has dominion over us. Amen. That's what the old rugged cross brings to us. We, that it no longer rules over us. We're not going to die the second death. May not die the first one either. Be all right with me. So Joshua said, verse 25, said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. That sounds like Jesus talking. Be strong and fear not, for I am with thee. He said, Be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. So it makes sense now that when God said to Eve and Adam and to the serpent, uh, it, it, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Truly, the heel of Jesus was bruised on the cross. But, simultaneously, the head of Satan, who has the power of death, was wounded on that day by the seed of the woman, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. On the cross, in his death, he becomes victorious over death. Um, be of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And after Joshua smote them, slew them, hanged them on five trees. And at, at this time, now when I get to this point, I'm going, wait a minute. Did he say they're hanging on a tree? <gasps> Cursed be anyone hanging from a tree. Is this about the cross? And then look what happened after that. They hanged them on five trees and they were hanging upon the trees until when? The evening. What did he say? Until they died. Until they died. Yep, that's, that, that works. <laughs> Jewish law being what it was, Joshua knew that they couldn't leave them hanging there. You know, I would want to leave them hanging there and go back the next day and just sit and watch the crows pick their eyes out. Verse 27, and it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun, just like Jesus, that Joshua commanded that they take them down off the trees, cast them in the cave. Where, that's the story. That's the, that's the gospel right there. Wherein they hid, did hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain until this very day. Christ's stone was rolled away. Their stone stays. They're dead and they're staying that way. Somebody... Uh, showed me a verse, in, was it today or yesterday? I can't remember. I should have wrote it down, but it was good. Um, where God told a certain people, uh, you're dead now, and you're not going to live again, ever. You're not going to be resurrected. And uh, so anyway, this is a, a picture and a story of the cross. Let's look at um, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and get sort of the the gist of this and what this story is about. We know we see the cross here. We know we see it. But what is, what is its true meaning? Uh, well, we're going to go to there a little. Okay? And there a little is in there a little chapter 15. 
and hear a little verse 21. Uh, the Bible, oh, I'm 14. The Bible says, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And what you're seeing here in 1 Corinthians 15, you'll see in Romans 5. For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so then by one man. And it just keeps going back and forth between the Adams, the two Adams. For as one man committed iniquity, and then sin abounded, then we have one man who dies one time and covers all of those sins that abound so that they don't abound. I'm paraphrasing. But that's basically what you get. It's, a, it's a, like a ping pong back and forth. Let's talk about Adam. Adam sinned. Christ is, he, he, it must be a man. God, the Bible says that God could not make Jesus in the form of the angels. It wouldn't work. He had to make them, him in the form of human, mortals, people that die. So that in his death, he cures death for every man who believes. Amen? So, uh, verse 21, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. It had to be Christ first. Why? Seek ye first. And I'm, te I'm going to teach this in the next Watchman broadcast, that idea that the number one shows preeminence. God, you know, people back years ago, that somebody came up with this, this bumper sticker that said, God is my co-pilot. And that sounded good until you started really thinking about it. Do you really want God to sit side saddle next to you while, and he do nothing while you're going, am I doing okay? No, you want God to fly the plane. You want him to drive the ship. Amen. That's what you want. And so cry, if you put Christ first in everything you do, I mean, it's why we go to church on the first day of the week. God first, God first. So Christ the first fruits, after that, afterward, they that are Christ that is coming, then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. Rule, authority, and power. How many things here? Three. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Three crosses, okay? And then it says, verse 25, for he must reign... Till he hath put all enemies where? Under his feet. Boys, Joshua, I mean, you fellas, come here. Put your feet on these guys' necks. I don't care if they're royalty. Come over here, put your feet on them. We're going to rule over them. They're not going to have dominion over us. We're not going to be slaves ever again. Amen. He must reign until he hath put all his enemies under his feet. In verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And you know what I did one time? I went and looked in the book of Revelation to see how true that was. And sure enough, the very last thing that's put into the lake of fire is death. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And after death is thrown in, there's nothing else to put in there because the last enemy and, and you think about how that how real how realistic that is in our walk of life with Christ truly in every born again person's walk with God the very last door they must walk through here on this earth is death's door the very last fight that they will fight is the fight ending their life. Death will be the last enemy that will be destroyed for each and every one of us if we're not taken up in the translation. And so, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 2, very quickly, verse 14. For as much then as the children, 
um, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So now you're kind of getting why it was fiery serpents that came in and bit all the Israelites and why God instructed Moses to make a brass serpent, put it on this brazen pole and lift it up so that everybody could see it. And when they, if they would look upon it, they would live. It was, God was showing all the way back in the book of Numbers the, the destruction of Satan and the power that he has. When Satan goes, death goes with him. Never to return again. Amen. He has, so now let me, I just thought of this. I don't know if I have an answer to it yet, but I'm going to throw something out to you. If that's true, and it is true what I just said. We know that Satan is going to be cast into the uh, bottomless pit for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, he's going to be released. He's going to try to gather his armies again for one last battle. It's not going to work. And then he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so for that thousand years that Satan is falling in the bottomless pit, does anybody die? I don't know. The Bible says that he's got the power of death. The devil, if he's falling a thousand years, he's not here killing people. I don't know. Whoever dies first among us, you ask God and come back and tell us. Okay? Well, won't that be freaky? Um, Verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death. And let's get honest. Okay? Um, Emily, bless your heart. Emily had a rough night last night. David was sick and, and uh, it, was, it was rough there for quite a while. Uh, God blessed him. He finally got some rest and he's doing a little bit better this evening. You pray for him. Um, but death scares us. Death scares us. And it, does, and it scares everybody. Nobody, you know, in a group and then somebody just falls dead. Nobody goes, I wonder what's on TV. It scares people. Okay, it's something that you take seriously. Uh, but anyway, verse 16, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels. I just said that a while ago. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. We are his brethren. He is our brother. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. That means he is able to give us comfort as we lean upon the breast of Jesus Christ. He gives us comfort and says, listen, I know you're afraid of dying. And it's because you, you don't know what to expect. You, know what, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. Don't worry. I've already been there and I've come back and I know the way and I will not leave you. I will be there with you the whole time. That makes it better. That makes it better. Okay?